Vladimir Nikolovich Nagra, Tales from the Future, The Linging Cedars of Russia book series, The Billionaire. From the book by Vladimir Nagra, The New Civilization, Part 1, translated by Susan Downing. Billionaire John Hitzman lay dying on the 42nd floor of his office building. That entire floor had been converted into an apartment suit for him. Over the past three years, it's two bedrooms, workout room, pool, living room, and two offices had become his refuge. Never once in these years had he set foot outside his apartment. Never once had he ridden the express elevator down to any of the office where the staff of his financial industry empire work. Never once had he gone up to the roof where his helicopter stood, its crew always at the ready to carry out the boss orders. Except that for three years, the boss had never once appeared. John Hitzman only ever saw his four closest assistants, whom he would receive three times a week in one of his office. At these short meetings, which never lasted more than 40 minutes, he would hear out their reports without any particular interest, and occasionally he'd give them brief instructions. The billionaire's direction were never discussed. They were simply carried out swiftly and precisely. The financial worth of the empire, of which John Hetzman was the sole owner, increased by 16.5% yearly. And over the last six months, when Hetzman had stopped holding any meeting whatsoever, the profit had not decreased. There were no interruptions whatsoever in the administrative mechanism he had created and then left to function on its own. No one knew how much Billionaire was really worth. His name was hardly ever mentioned in the press. Hitzman strictly observed the rule, never talked about money. Way back when the young Hitzman father would give him this advice, let the politicians flicker across the TV screens and the newspaper pages. Let the presidents and governors talk with the people and give them assurances that their lives will be happy. Let the visible millionaires ride around in luxury cars surrounded by bodyguards. You, Johnny, you don't need to do, you don't need to do all of that. You need to always be behind the scenes, controlling the governments and presidents the billionaires and the destitute of various countries by means of your power, the power of money. But they should not have any idea who's controlling them. This system is exceptionally simple. I created a monetary fund that has many investors on paper, but in, rela but in reality, it contains 70% of my own capital under various different names. On the outside, to the, to the dim wit masses, it looks like the fund was created to support developing countries. But in reality, I created it, I create it as a mechanism for collecting payments from all countries. I'll give you an example. An armed conflict begins between two countries and one of them or more likely both of them needs money. Let them have it because they're paid back with interest. Social upheaval occurs in some country and once again, they need money. Let them have it. They're paid back with interest. Two political forces are fighting for power. One of them will receive money from our agents and once again, they're paid back with interest. 
Russia alone pays us $3 billion every year. When he was 20, John Hitzman was particularly fond of spending time with his father. One day, this father, who had previously always been strict and unsociable, called John into his office and invited him to make himself comfortable in a chair by the fire. He himself poured John a cup of John's favorite coffee with cream and asked him and asked him with unfeigned interest, do you, do you enjoy studying at the university, John? I don't always find it interesting, Dad. It seems to me that the professors don't always explain the laws of economics in a very clear or comprehensible way. John answered honestly. Good. An accurate observation. But it would be even more accurate to put it this way. Today's academics aren't capable of explaining the laws of economics because they have no understanding of them. They somehow think that economic is the domain of economists, but that's not the case. It's psychologists, philosophers, and gamblers who control the world economy. When I turned 20, John, my father, and your grandfather initiated me into the secrets of management. You're already 20, John, and I consider you a worthy vessel for this knowledge. Thank you, Father, John replied. And so through this, these fireside chats, John began to study laws of economics laws different from the ones taught in college. His father used a unique method to teach his son. All instruction was imparted through intimate, kind-hearted discussions that included examples and even playful elements. The information that John's father laid out before him was unbelievable, and it goes without saying that he couldn't have acquired it in any university in the world even the most prestigious, prestigious. Tell me, John, his father asked, do you know how many rich people there are in our country or in the world? They publish their names in business journals and list them in order according to their worth, John answered quietly. Do you know what place we occupy in these lists? This was the first time his father had said we instead of I. That meant he thought of him, John, as an owner too. And although he didn't want to upset his father, John replied, Your name doesn't appear on those lists, father. Yes, correct, it doesn't. In spite of the fact that our profit from year alone, from one year alone, exceeds the entire worth of many, who appear on those lists. And my name isn't on any list because one should never make one's wallet transparent. Many people on these lists are working directly or indirectly for empire. Yours and mine, son. Dad, you must be an ec economic genius. I can't begin to imagine how you can get such a huge empire as Russia to make tribute payments to us every year without any military intervention at all. Heisman Sr. took the fireplace tongues, poked the logs, and then silently poured a glass of white wine for himself and his son. He took a small sip, and only then did he continue. It isn't that I developed some kind of operation. The capital I control only allows me to give orders. Others carry them out. Many analysts, presidents, and geniuses in the government of various countries would be quite surprised to learn that it's not their action that determine the current state of their countries, but my wishes. The Polytechnic Center's Economics Institute think tanks and governmental structures of many countries don't realize that they work strictly along courses developed by my division and that these courses are few in number. For example, 
Russia's entire social, economic, policy, and military doctrines are defined and controlled by one division with a staff of four psychologists. Each of the four has four secretaries. None of them knows about what the others are doing. I'll show you how we manage to control things. It's a simple enough process. But first, John, you need to understand the real laws of econ economics, the ones you never hear about from the academics. They simply have no idea they exist. The law is this. Within a democratic society, the presidents, governments, banks, and the large and small business owners of all countries work only for one business owner located at the top of the economic pyramid. They all work for my father. Now they work for me. And before long, they'll be working only for you. John Hitzman looked at his father and couldn't fully take in what he said. Certainly he knew his father was rich, but here he wasn't talking simply about wealth, but about the superpower that he, John, would inherit. He was having a hard time fully comprehending this incredible piece of information. How was it possible that within a free Democratic society, everyone, starting with the president and ending with hundreds of thousands of large and small firms, all of them independent legal entities, entities were essentially working for one person, his father. When your grandfather told me what I've just told you, I couldn't immediately comprehend what he said. And I imagine you don't quite get everything either, John. But understand this. Heitzman Sr. continued, There are wealthy people in the world. But for every wealthy person, there's one who's wealthier. And there's one who's the wealthiest of all. All the other wealthy people, and consequently all who work under them too, work for him. The wealthiest one, such is the law of the system in which we live. All the talk about selfless aid to developing country is nothing but a smokescreen. Certainly wealthy countries offer credit to developing countries through international funds. But the only real reason they do that is to receive good, solid interest in exchange for the use of those funds to receive tribute payments. For example, Russia pays $3 billion a year to the IMF, and that figure represents only the interest Russian has accumulated on the money it's borrowed. Many economists know that the main financing for the IMF comes from US, from US capital. They understand that the sky-high interest that countries pay to borrow money goes to the U.S. But who specifically receives it? No one knows that. The U.S. as a country is no more than a convenient front in the game of capital. And the U.S. is the country most dependent on capital. Tell me, John, are you aware that America has a national debt? Yes, Dad, I'm aware of that. The debt figure is astronomical. For last year, it amounted to, the interest paid on America's debt amounted to. So do you see that a country that lends on money to other countries itself takes on huge amounts of debt? But from whom does it borrow? Do you understand that? From its own Federal Reserve. But to whom does that belong? This Federal Reserve, to, to, John had never thought about who America owed money to. 
but as he answered his father's questions, he understood. In the U.S., each taxpayer pays into the Federal Reserve, but it, the Federal Reserve, is a private bank. Consequently, all of America pays hundreds of billions of dollars to some private people or to one private person his whole life. Hitzman had never been a vain person. He'd led a, a healthy life, as they say, didn't drink or smoke, followed healthy diets and worked out every day. It was only in the last six months that he'd stopped going to his workout room. For half a year, he's been lying in bed in one of his spacious bedrooms that was, that was chock full of ultra-modern medical equipment. In the room next door, doctors were on duty 24 hours a day working Working, working in shifts, but John Hitzman didn't up, didn't trust modern medical science. He saw no need to even talk with the doctors. The only person he would occasionally favor with short answers was a certain psychology professor. Hitzman wasn't even interested in knowing the doctors' names, including this professor, although he took note that this one was the most sincere and honest of the bunch. The professor talked a lot, but what often came across when he spoke were not only medical assertions, but also his own thoughts and his desire to find out what was causing Hitzman's illness. Hitzman illness. I was thinking about your condition last night and this morning. I can see it now. I'll figure out what's causing your illness and then, once we've eliminated the cause, you'll get well in short order. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Heitzman. I forgot to say hello. Good morning, Mr. Heitzman. I was a little distracted by my own thoughts. The billionaire didn't respond to the professor's greeting and didn't turn in his direction. But that was how he acted with all the doctors. And sometimes when a doctor came in, Hitzman would give a signal, a slight movement of the wrist. And everyone knew that this signal meant go away. He didn't give the signal to the professor. And so the professor excitedly continued sharing his train of thought. I disagree with my colleagues who say you need liver, kidney, and heart transplants. It's true that these organs aren't functioning as effectively as they should. Hmm. Yes, not a, as effectively as they should be. The cause of this lies in your deep depression. Hmm. Yes, your depression. I've read your chart over several times. And I think I've made a very important discovery. Your primary care doctor is amazing. He noted down everything in great detail. Every time he examined you, he also made notes about your psychological state. Your internal organs began to fail as soon as you entered a depressed state. Hmm. Yes, a state. Now here's the most important question. Did the depression arise when your internal organs began to fail or was it the other way around? Did the depression cause all your body's organs to fail? I'm certain that's it. I'm completely certain that the primary cause is the depression. Hmm. Yes, your deep depression the state when a person stops, stops striving toward a goal, loses interest in what's going on around him, when he doesn't see any point in living, and then the brain begins sending out weak or erratic signals to the entire body. The entire body, the stronger the depression, the weaker the signals. 
And when the depression reaches a certain level of intensity, the brain can stop sending these signals entirely and then death ensues. And so the primary cause is depression, but how can we eliminate it entirely? Modern medicine doesn't know how to do that. I've looked into folk medicine and now I'm convinced that the cause of your deep depression is the evil eye. Hmm. Yes, or to be more precise, someone put the evil eye on you and I have a lot of facts that can prove it. The billionaire wanted to give the go away signal with his hand. He had no use for all those esoteric alternative healing practitioners today who promised to remove hexes and the evil eye and provide protection against them. He thought of them as small businessmen or swindlers. It seemed that the professor, sensing that modern medicine was powerless here, had himself migrated to the ranks of these so-called alternative healers. Before the billionaire could give the go-away signal, the professor cut him off with words that elicited a bit of interest. Faint but interest all the same. I sense that you're about to send me away now. Maybe forever, I ask you. I beg you. Give me five or six more minutes. If you understand what I tell you, then it's possible that you can get well. And I'll have, and I'll have made a great discovery. Well, actually, I've already made it. I just need to confirm it. The billionaire did not give the go-away signal after all. For three seconds, the professor stared without blinking at the hand of the man lying motionless before him and seeing that he had permission to proceed quickly began speaking once more. People look at each other in a variety of ways with indifference, with love, with hatred, envy, fear, respect. But it isn't the eyes. External expression that plays the key role here. The outer expression can be nothing more than a mask, like the false smile of a waiter or a salesperson. What's important is the true relationship, the true feelings one person has for another. The more positive feelings people direct toward this or that person, the more positive energy concentrates inside him. Conversely, if he's surrounded if he's surrounded predominantly by negative feelings, then it's the negative and the destructive that build up within him. The common folk call this the evil eye. And this is what healers focus on in their practice. Not all of them are, are charlatans, Not by a long shot. The thing is that a person who's received too much negative energy from those around him is himself capable of neutralizing it or in other words, of bringing it back into balance. When a healer tells someone that he's removing the evil eye by doing certain actions, actions, he's helping the person believe that he's been cleansed. If the person believes the healer, then the person himself really does bring the positive and negative into balance inside him. If he doesn't believe, then this doesn't happen. You don't have faith in healers, and consequently, they can't help you. But that doesn't mean that you don't have an excessive negative psych energy in you. Energy that's harmful to your organism. Organism. Why do I say you have an excessive negative energy? Well, because everyone around a person like you can't help but view you with envy. And not in the positive sense. They also might see you or more precisely relate to you with hatred. Those would be the people you fired or haven't given raises to. Many people sensing your power could be fearful of you. So you see, this all is negative energy and you need positive energy to counterbalance it. You can receive this from your family members and relatives, but your wives betray you and you have no children or friends and you don't spend time with your relatives. You have no source of positive energy. 
It is possible for a person to produce as much positive energy as he needs on his own. But to do that, he has to have a cherished goal or dream, one that will cause positive emotions to arise as he gradually moves toward it. You've achieved a great deal, and it seems that now you no longer have any dreams. But this is very important. Having a goal and moving toward achieving it, I've analyzed the physical and the psychological state states of various types of businessmen. A person who makes some dough, bakes some pies and sells them is happy to have the opportunity to then buy the items he needs. And he dreams of developing his business because only when it grows can he enjoy many of the prizes of an advanced civilization. A prominent banker or the owner of a profitable firm also strives to develop his business and increase his income, but he's often less passionate about it than the person who bakes or sells pies. It sounds paradoxical, but it's a known fact. He's less passionate, less because far fewer appealing prizes lie ahead for him than for the pie seller. For him, the majority of civilization's achievements aren't prizes, but mundane reality. If someone who's not particularly wealthy has a chance to buy a car, then buying it gives him a feeling of satisfaction or even delight. But a person who's relatively wealthy won't feel happy when he gets the latest car model. For him, it's a trifle. It sounds paradoxical to say that the wealthy have fewer occasions for happiness than those who are less well off, but it's true. There is one more thing that can bring happiness, conquering one competitors. But it seems that you, Mr. Hitsman, have no competitors. And so it turns out that you have nothing but negative energies affecting you, and a lot of them. Oh yes, and I forgot to say, that there is one energy, a strong, unbelievable, strong energy that can vanquish a multitude of negative energies. And it is called the energy of love. It's the energy you feel when you are in love and someone loves you. But unfortunately, you don't have any woman at all in your life. You don't seem to be interested in them And given your age and your current condition, you probably won't ever be interested in them again. I have a lot of corroborating facts to back up my conclusion. I've compared the statistical data about the lifespans of wealthy people. Prominent politicians and presidents over the past hundred years. The results are pretty convincing. The lifespan of the powerful people of this world is not so very great compared to that of regular folks, and often it's even less. Paradoxical, but facts are facts. Presidents and millionaires who are under the constant care of doctors and have access to the most up-to-date medical technologies and medicines, who have the ability to consume only the highest quality food, get sick and die with the same frequency frequency as everyone else. These facts eloquently attest to the fact that the negative energy surrounding a person is extremely powerful, powerful, and that even the most modern medical methods are no match for it. So does that, so does that mean there's no way out of this situation? No, there is a way out. Maybe a small way, maybe only one way, but it does exist. Hmm. Yes, it does exist. Memories. My esteemed John Hitzman, please, Heitzman, please, make an effort to recall the very stages of your life, the stages that brought you pleasant sensations. And the most important thing is this. If there were times when you made a soulman promise to someone and didn't keep it, then try to keep it now. If at all possible, I ask you, for your own sake, 
for the sake of science, make an effort to recall the good times, even for just a few days. These monitors record the function of many of your organs. They record it every minute. If you start doing what I'm asking you to do, and if the monitors record positive results, then we'll have the chance to find a path back to health. Hmm. Yes, to find it, I will definitely find it. Or maybe you will find it. Or maybe the path itself. Life will find it. The professor stopped talking and looked once more at the hand of the man who lay there motionless. A second later, Heitzman characteristics gesture sent the professor on his way. Like many people, John Heitzman would sometime reminisce about the past. To some degrees, to some degree, he understood what the professor had been talking about. He could make an effort to find some good moments in his past, and maybe they really would have a positive effect. But the whole problem with this was that the life he'd lived didn't seem pleasant to him now. It seemed uninteresting and even pointless. Heisman recalled how he'd gotten married on the advice of his father to the daughter, daughter of a billionaire who added to their empire's wealth. The marriage didn't bring him any satisfaction. His wife turned out to be an inf infertile. And after 10 years of married life, she died of a drug overdose. Then he married a famous young model. She played the role of a wife passionately in love with her husband. But after a mere six months of married life, Heisman's security staff presented him with photos of his wife converting with his, her former lover. He didn't even talk to her about it. He just told security to arrange it so he'd never have to lay eye on her again. And so he had no memories of her. As he remises, husband came to the period when he began working for his father's empire and he couldn't identify a single pleasant moment where he felt like stopping to take in some positive emotions. There was only one pleasant moment when he proved to his father that they didn't need to be the sole owner of the monetary fund. The other investors who were contributing to their own capital to the fund and who wanted to increase that capital would expend their own mental energy on increasing the overall capital of the fund. And that meant those investors were working for them, for the Heismans. His father thought this over for several days. Then one day at dinner, this father was, who was so stingy with his prey said, I agree to your proposal regarding the fund, Johnny. It's correct, good for you. Give some thought to what other direc directions we should be heading in. Give some thought to what other direction we should be heading in. It's time for you to take the helm. For several days, John Heisman felt exhilarated, and as a result, he was able to make several more decisions that increased the financial empire profit. Even so, he didn't experience any particular joy. The reports noting larger profits than before were devoid of emotion. There was no one left to praise him. His father had died, and the praise of one Swabinitz brings no joy. And so John Heisman traveled back in his recollections to his childhood. His memory, his memory listlessly elim eliminated the rare moments of contact with his father. More often than, that, than not, John's strict father would reprimand him in the presence of the nannies and tutors assigned to him. Then suddenly something like a wave of warmth flowed through the body of the billionaire who was lying there motionless. His body twitched with a pleasant sensation. A very sharp and clear picture arose in Heisman's recollections. A far corner of the garden surrounded by 
Acai tree stood a little house about two meters high with one tiny window. A yearning that one can entirely understand. The yearning nearly every child possess to create his own little home, his own space. This yearning has nothing to do with whether the child has his own separate room in his parents' house or shares a room with his parents. Nearly every child goes through a period when he begins to build his own little corner of the world with his own two hands. Clearly a person has a gene that stores some kind of very ancient information and it says to him, you need to create your own space on your own. And the person, a child, heeding this call that has come to him from the depths of eternity begins to construct it. And even if it can't ever compare to today's mentions, all the same, the person will feel more serene in this spot that he's made for himself than he will in any mansion. And so nine-year-old John Heitzman, who had two spacious rooms in his family's country house at his disposal, nonetheless decided to build himself a little house with his own two hands. He built it out of plastic seedling pots. These pots ended up being very suitable for building. They came in a variety of colors. John used blue pots for the walls and then made a strip border that ran all the way around the perimeter, perimeter of some yellow ones. He set out the pots one inside the other and they slip into the little grooves, grooves fastening themselves together. John laid one of the walls by laying the pots on top of each other on their sides. So the bottoms face out and on the inside. It made a whole wall full of shelves. For the roof of this little house, of his little house, John used boards, which he then covered with plastic sheeting and fastened to the board using a stapler. He spent a whole week building his little house, making use of the three hours allotted to him each day for being out in the fresh air. On the seventh day, as soon as it was time for his walk, Johnny immediately set off for his creation in the far corner of the garden. Pulling aside the acai branches, he glimpsed the little house he built and then stopped in surprise. A little girl was standing next to the entrance to the house and looking inside. His creation. The little girl was wearing a light blue skirt that reached below her knees and a white top with frailed sleeves. Ringlets of chestnut hair fell to her shoulders. At first Johnny felt jealous to see some stranger here by his creation and he couldn't help but ask, what are you doing here? The little girl turned her beautiful little face in Johnny's direction and answered, I'm admiring. What? This marvelous and smart little house. What? What kind? Johnny acts again, astonished. Marvelous and smart, the little girl repeated. Houses can be marvelous, but I've never heard of one being smart. Only people can be smart, Johnny noted seriously. Well, of course, people can be smart. And when a smart person makes a little house, then the house is smart too, the girl objected. What do you think is so smart about this house? That wall inside it is very smart. It has a real lot of little shelves. You should put a lot of things you need on those shelves and toys too. Johnny liked the way the little girl thought her remarks flattered him, and maybe he liked the little girl too. She's pretty and she's smart thinker, Johnny thought to himself. Then he said out loud, I've built this little house. Then he immediately asked, what's your name? I'm Sally, I'm seven years old. I live here in the servant's house because my daddy is the gardener here. He knows a lot about plants and is teaching me about them. I know how to grow flowers already too and how to 
graft branches onto trees. So what's your name and where do you live? I live in the country house. My name is Shani. So you're the owner's sons? Yes, his son. Come on, Johnny, let's play in the little house together. How should we play? We'll play that we live in the, in the house just like grown-ups do. You'll be the owner since you're the owner's son and I'll be your servant since my father's one of the servants. That won't work, Johnny noted. A servant has to live in the servant's quarters. Only the husband, the wife, and their children can live in the country house. Then I'll be your wife, Sally blurted out and then asked, can I be your wife for a while, Johnny? Johnny didn't answer. He went inside the house, looked around, then turned towards Sally, who was still standing outside the doorway and answered casually, okay, come on in and pretend you're my wife. We have to think how to set things up inside. Sally came into the little house, looked into Johnny's eyes with tenderness and delight and said, almost whispered, thank you, Johnny, I'll try to be a good wife. Johnny didn't visit his little house every day. He wasn't always allowed to play in the garden during walk time. Accompanied by bodyguards, he'd visit a city park or Disneyland or go horseback riding. But almost every time he did manage to visit the house, Sally was there waiting for him. And each time he came, Johnny was interested to see what had changed in the little house. First, a throw rug Sally had bought appeared on the floor, then little curtains on the window opening over the entrance. Then he noticed a little round child's table with an empty picture frame, and Sally said, You come to our house less and less all the time, Johnny. I wait for you, but you don't come. Why don't you give me your picture, and I'll put it in this little frame. I'll look at your picture, and that way it will be more fun for it will be more fun for to wait for you. When Johnny came to say goodbye to the little house and to Sally, he left his folder there. He and his parents were moving to another country house. John Heisman, multi-billionaire, lay in bed in his suite and smiled as he recalled more and more details about the time he spent as a child with the little girl Sally. Only now did he realize that this little girl had loved him. He was her first love, and her love was childish, reckless, and unrequited. Maybe he had loved her too, or maybe he had just liked her. But she had loved him in a way that most likely no one else in his whole life ever had. And so now, Reminiscing about the little house he'd built in the garden, about his time spent with Sally, even now, pleasant warm feelings arose in him. These feelings warmed his body and he felt good. He saw Sally once, only once more after he moved away, 11 years later. But this encounter, some new feelings stirred throughout his body. John Heitzman Heitzman even raised himself up a bit in bed. His heart began pumping blood through his veins with ever greater force. That meeting, he'd forgotten about it. He never gave it any thought. But right now, he could have think of anything else. He couldn't think of anything else. And the very thought of it agitated him. He went back to the estate where he spent his childhood 11 years later. For only one day, he didn't have time to stay longer. After lunch, he went out into the garden and somehow it happened that he found himself heading for the far corner of the garden where as a child he built his little house among the acais. He pulled aside the branches, stepped inside the little glade and stood there, stock still in surprise. The house he built 11 years earlier out of plastic pots were still standing in the very same spot as before. But all around it, around it were small flower beds and a path covered with sand led to the entrance. And a little bench now stood by the entrance and flower vines had entwined the little house itself. There wasn't a bench there before, but now 
There is. Grown-up Johnny noted to himself. He pulled aside the curtain that covered the entrance and bending over into the little house. He immediately sensed that someone had recently been there. The photograph of him as a boy stood on the table. As before, Sally's childhood toys were neatly arranged on the little shelves. A small bowl on one of the shelves next to the little table held fresh fruit. An inflatable mattress lay on the floor covered with a bedspread. John stood in the little house for 20 minutes or so, recalling the pleasant sensation from his childhood. He thought, why is this happening? Their family owned a lot of fancy country houses and they had a castle, but country houses and castles didn't produce the kind of pleasant feelings that arose here in the little house made of ordinary plastic seeding pots, seedling pots. He saw Sally when he came out of the house. She was standing silently by the entrance as if she couldn't bring herself to interrupt John's flood of memories. John glanced at her and Sally's cheeks flushed. She lowered her eyes in embarrassment and a soft, velvety voice that was unusually tender and excited, she said. Hello, Johnny. He didn't answer right away. He stood there admiring the grown-up Sally's unusual beautiful body. Her light dress that hugged her figure fluttered in the breeze. Through the dress, he could see the lines of her lithe young woman's figure. She was no longer a child. Hi, Sally, John said, interrupting the lengthy pause. So you're still keeping things in order around here? Yes, after all, I promised. There's some fruit there. It's been washed, have some, it's for you. Ah, oh, yes, for me. Well, okay, let's go in together and we'll have something to eat. John pulled aside the curtain and let Sally go ahead of him. She went in, squatted down to pick up the bowl and put it on the table next to the frame photo. There were no chairs in the little house so John took a seat on the rug. Reaching for a bunch of grapes, he brushed against Sally's shoulder. She turned, their eyes met, and Sally took a quick, quick deep breath. A button on the dress atop her firm breast came undone when she breathed in sharply. John took Sally by the shoulder and drew her to him. She offered no resistance, quite the opposite. She pressed herself to him with the entirety, entirety of her burning body, and she did not resist when John slowly and carefully laid her down atop the rug, or when he caressed and kissed her lips and her breasts, or when he. Sally was a virgin. Never before had John been intimate with a virgin, nor was he ever again. And now, 45 years after that last encounter with Sally, John Heitzman suddenly understood that this was the only time he had ever experienced truly beautiful, mind-blowing intimacy with a, with a woman, or rather with a girl whom he made a woman. Afterwards, they fell asleep for a short while. When they awoke, they talked about something. But what? John Heisman strained his memory. He really wanted to remember at least part of this conversation. And he did. Sally was talking about how wonderful life was. She told him how her father was saving up to buy her a plot of land and that he might, if there was enough money, build her a little house. Sally herself would do all the landscape design and the plot would put in a lot of different plants and would live there happily raising her children. John made a mental note then to help Sally. Amazing, he thought to himself back then. All this girl needs to be happy is some plot of land and a little house. Why, that's nothing at all. I have to remember to help her get that land and a house too. But John forgot about his desire. Basically, he forgot about Sally. Life infatuated him with its delights. A new yacht, 
and his own jet brought him joy for the first few days. Then for a long time, only the game of high finance infatuated him. Infatuated him and added billions to his father's fortune, the fortune he would subsequently inherit. This infatuation, which agitated his emotions, and strain his nerves lasted for more than 20 years. It dominated everything else. He went, through first one, he went through first one marriage and then another as if they were just digressions. His wives left behind no trace of themselves. After 45 years, playing the financial game no longer brought him any satisfaction and he began to experience episodes of depression which grew more and more frequent, ultimately leading to a profound depressive crisis. But right now, John Heisman was not feeling depressed. Reminiscing about Sally had stirred him in a pleasant way, and it had annoyed him too. How did that happen? I made a promise to myself to help Sally, the girl who loved me, acquire a plot of land in a house, and then I forgot. John Heisman, who was used to keeping his promise, promises, particularly ones he'd made to himself, knew one thing for sure. His annoyance at himself wouldn't pass until he pushed a button to call his secretary. When the sec- secretary entered, John Heisman, who was now sitting on the bed, spoke for the first time in six months pronouncing the words with difficulty. A little more than 50 years ago, I live in a country house. I don't recall the exact address. You'll find it in the records. There was a gardener who worked at the country house. I don't recall his last name, but you'll find it in the accountant's file. The gardener had a daughter. Her name was Sally. Find out where Sally lives now. I need this information no later than tomorrow morning. If you get the information sooner, deliver it to me immediately, no matter what time it is. Make it happen. Sir, the gardener was let go 40 years ago and died not long afterwards. Before he died, he managed to buy two hectares of land on an abandoned ranch in the state of Texas. He started to build a house on that land, over exerted himself during construction and died. His daughter Sally finished building the house and now lives in it. Here is the address. We haven't been able to get any information as of yet, but all you need to do is tell us and we'll get you all the information you need. John Heisman took the slip of paper from the secretary, read it carefully then neatly folded it up, placed it in his inside jacket pocket and said, have the helicopter ready to take off in 30 minutes. It will need to land five to 10 kilometers from the house in Texas. Have a car meet me at the landing spot. Not a luxury car, car. no security, just a driver, make it happen. At three o'clock in the afternoon, John Heisman, limping and leaning on a cane, made his way along a crushed stone pathway to a small cottage, overgrown with greenery. At first he saw her from behind. An elderly woman was standing on a small ladder, washing a window. John Heisman stopped and began to look at this woman with the beautiful salt and pepper hair. She sensed his gaze and turned in his direction. She peered for a bit at the old man standing on her path, then suddenly hopped off the ladder and began running toward him. She ran with ease. This woman did not look old at all. She stopped about a meter from John Heisman. In a soft, excited voice, she said, Hello, Johnny. She immediately dropped her eyes, covering her flushed cheeks with both her hands. Hello, Sally, John Heitzman said, and then fell silent, or rather, he spoke, but only to himself, not out loud. How beautiful you are, Sally, and your shining eyes. 
and the tiny wrinkles next to them are so beautiful too. You are just as beautiful and kind, aloud he said. I was just passing through Sally and I found out, well, that you lived here, so I decided to visit you and maybe stay the night if that won't put you out. I'm very happy to see you, Johnny. Of course, do stay the night. I'm here alone for now. Tomorrow they're bringing my grandchildren to spend a week with me. There are two of them. My granddaughter is nine years old and my grandson is already 12. Come along into the house, Johnny. I'll give you an infusion to drink. I know just what kind of infusion you need. Come along. So that means you were married, Sally. You have children. I still am married, Johnny. We had one son and now two grandchildren. Sally replied joyfully. Why don't you have a seat at the table in the gazebo and I'll bring you your infusion. John Hitzman took a seat. Heitzman took a seat on a plastic lawn chair out on the house veranda. And when Sally brought him a large wine glass with some infusion, he asked, Sally, why did you say you knew just what kind of infusion I needed? Well, my father would gather herbs and dry them and then make infusions for your father. And they would help your father. I learned to gather herbs too. And my dad told me that you have the same hereditary illness as your father, Johnny. But now, how did you know when I come to visit? I didn't know, Johnny, you see. I gathered the herb just in case. So, Johnny, how did your life turn out? What do you do? My life's taken various twists and turns. I've done this and that, but I don't feel like remembering that now. It feels good here with you, with you. Sally, it's beautiful. You have a lot of flowers, a garden. Yes, it feels good here. I like it very much. The only thing is, do you see over there to the right? They have started building something there. It's going to be a garbage processing plant and they want to build some kind of factory there on the left too. And they want us to move somewhere else. But your trip must have tired you out. It's clear you've come a long way, Johnny. I see how tired you are. I'll make a bed up for you by the open window. And you go lie down and have a good rest. Just drink up your infusion first. John Heitzman, Hitzman had a difficult time getting undressed. He really was tired. His muscles atrophied from lying motionlessly for six months could barely keep him on his feet. It was hard for him to pull the blanket up over himself. But once he had, he went right to sleep. These days, he usually couldn't get to sleep at all without a sleeping pill. But here, he went right to sleep. He didn't see the morning at all because he awoke only at noon. He took a shower and went out into the veranda. Sally was getting lunch ready in the summer kitchen, and a little boy and a girl were helping her. Good afternoon, Johnny. I can see you slept well. You look like you've grown so much younger. Here, meet my grandchildren. This is Emmy, and this young man's name is George. And I'm John Heitzman. Good morning, he said, extending his hand to the little boy. Good, now you've gotten acquainted. While Emmy and I make lunch, why don't you men have a walk around the garden and work up an appetite, Sally suggested. I can show you the garden, George said to Heisman. The old man and the little boy strolled through the beautiful garden. The boy pointed out various plants and talked nonstop about all the properties. Heisman was busy thinking his own thoughts. When they reached the end of the garden, the boy announced, and here, behind this acai tree, is my mansion. 
Prima built it. Heisman moved a branch aside and saw. In the small glades beyond the acai stood his little house, made of the same plastic sealing pots. Only the roof was made differently, and the curtain covering the entrance was different. Heisman moved the curtain aside, bent over a bit, and stepped into the little house. Everything was arranged just like before, except that on the table there was a photograph pressed between two sheets of plexiglass. It was a photo of Sally's grandson. Just as it should be, John Heitzman thought, the house has a different master now, and a different photo too. Heisman picked up the photo and just to have something to say said, you came out well in this picture, George. But that's not a picture of me, Uncle John. That's a picture of the little boy Grandma was friend with when she was little. He just happens to look like me. A limping John Heisman was trying to move along the garden path as quickly as he could, leaning on his stick and stumbling at, as he went. He went up to Sally and breathing quickly, a bit confused, he asked. And where is he now? Where is your husband now, Sally? Where is he? John, please calm down. It's not good for you to be agitated. Please sit down, Sally said softly. You see, John, it just so happened that way. When I was a child, I promised a certain very good little boy that I would be his wife. But we were just playing. John practically shouted, jumping up from his chair. We were just children playing. Be that as it may, let's just say that I'm still playing. And then I'm pretending you're my husband, Sally said, and quietly added. My husband and my beloved, George, looked a lot like me when I was a boy. Does that mean you had a baby after that night, Sally? Did you have a baby? Yes, I had our son, John. He looks like me, but he has your very strong genes, and our grandson is like a copy of you. John Hitzman looks back and forth between Sally and the little boy and girl, who were setting the table on the veranda, and he couldn't say another word. His thinking and his feelings were all confused, and for some reason, he himself didn't understand. He said, speaking sternly, I have to leave right now, right away. Goodbye, Sally. He took two steps down the path, turned around and walked up to Sally, who was standing there silently. John Heisman, struggling and leaning on his cane, went down on one knee before Sally, took her hand and slowly kissed it. Sally, I have something very important to do, something I can't put off. I have to leave right now. She laid her hand on his head and tousled his hair a bit. Yes, of course, if you have important things to do, problems to solve, then you need to go. If things get difficult for you, John, then come here to us. Our sons owns a small company now. It's got a lovely name, Lotus, and they do landscape design work. He doesn't have any special training, but I taught him myself. And he's come up with some very talented projects and he can barely keep up with the work. He helps me out with money and comes to visit me every month. I imagine you must be having money problems and a few health problems too. Come see us, John. I know how to get your health back and we'll have enough money. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. I have to get there in time. I have two. He walked along the path to the exit, lost in thought about his plan, and Sally watched John's receding figure and whispered to him herself, Come back, my love. And an hour later, she repeated, repeated this phrase once more as an incantation. She forgot all about her grandchildren, and she didn't notice a helicopter circling for more than half an hour up above her plot of land with its little house and beautiful garden. John Hitzman's helicopter hadn't even landed on the roof of his office building yet, 
but his closest assistants and secretaries were already waiting in the meeting room, feverishly checking their figures and preparing to report to their boss. They were no longer used to having him present at their meetings, and so now they await their boss with a certain degree of trepidation and fright. John Hetzman came in and everyone stood up. He started speaking before he even got into his spot at the head of the table. Take your seats, no reports, listen carefully because I'm not going to repeat anything. There's no time for that. So, there's a country estate in Texas. Texas. Here's, its, uh, here's its address. I instruct you to buy up all the land within a hundred mile radius of the estate. Buy up all the industrial complexes located on that land, even if you have to pay three times what they're worth. Those of you who handle real estate transactions can leave and get the operation moving immediately. If need be, put all your agents to work. This operation should take no more than one week. One of the assistants jumped up and hurriedly headed for the exit. John Hetzman, Hetzman continued. All of the buildings, factories, and plants on those lands are to be demolished within no more than a month's time, even if you need to bring in hundreds of construction companies to do it. Within a month, the area where they once stood needs to be seeded with grass. John Hitzman addressed the sole remaining assistant in the room. There's a small company in Texas with the beautiful name of Lotus. Execute a five-year contract with them. Put them in charge of drawing up plans for a settlement to be located on all the land we acquire surrounding that state in Texas. Whatever price they ask for, double it, make it happen. Two weeks later, John Hetzman was addressing a crowd of 1,500 people. The landscape designers, botanists, and agronomists in the audience had made their way to this auditorium through employment agencies. All of them were hoping to get work, especially since the ad had specified a contract price that was twice what they usually earned. John Hitzman came out on stage and began speaking in his usual category categorical and even slightly gruff way. In accordance with the contracts presented to you, each of you will be allotted irrevocable lifetime use of a plot of land, two hectares in size. You will given several designs of prefabricated homes to choose from. And these homes will be built on each plot on the spot you specify at our company's expense. Every year for five years, our company will pay out the sum of money specified in the contract to each adult member of the family. Your task is to develop this territory granted to you for lifetime use, to plant gardens and flower beds, to dig ponds and lay out paths, to make everything lovely and good. Our company will cover the cost of all saplings and any seeds you request. That's all I have to say. If there are no questions, those who wish to do so can come sign their contracts. But complete silence reigned in this audience of 1,500 people. Not a single person rose up from his seat to approach the little tables, where secretaries sat with the contract awaiting signatures. After a minute of complete silence, the elder man rose, elderly man rose from his seat and asked, Tell me, sir, this location you're suggesting we move to, is it lethal? lethally contaminated? No answer one of Heisman's second assistants. On the contrary, this location is exceptionally environmentally pure and its land is suitable, product, productive. Then tell us, be honest, what kind of experiment, experiment are you planning to carry out on people? Asks a young woman, jumping up from her seat. Many of us have children, and I, for one, have no intention of subjecting my child to who knows what kind of experiment. The audience began to buzz, and cries of opportunists, inhumane, and monsters began to be heard. People began getting up from their seats, and one by one they began leaving the auditorium. Heidsman assistant tried to offer some explanation to answer some of people's questions, but in vain. Heisman watched hopelessly as people flowed out of the auditorium. He stood, he understood that if they left, that would be the end of his hope, or even the end of more than that. 
he so wanted to do something nice for Sally, for his son and his grandchildren. He didn't want there to be any sm smokestacks next to Sally's cozy country house. He wanted there to be gardens blooming and kind neighbors living around her. He brought up the land and on his orders, they torn the smokestacks down and they sown grass. But the only way the land could improve was if good people came to live on it. But they were leaving. They hadn't understood. And how could they understand? How could they believe? Stop. Suddenly it dawned on Heisman. They didn't believe because they didn't know anything. What if he were to tell them the truth? John Heisman stood up and quietly, hesitantly, at first began speaking. People, I understand. I have to explain what's motivating my company to take these actions. But it's impossible to explain. Totally impossible. That's because I, you see, my motivation, or rather all of these contracts, are very important to me personally. Or how should I put it? Heisman got confused and wasn't sure how to continue. But the people had stopped. They were standing in the aisles and in the doorways of the exits, and they were looking intently at Heisman. They were saying a word, and he wasn't sure what to say next. Even so, he pulled himself together, and he went on. When I was a child, when I was a young man, I came to love a certain girl. But back then, I didn't realize I loved her. I married other women, had a business. This girl and I didn't see each other for 50 years. I didn't remember about her. But not long ago, I remembered about her. I understood that she was the only person who had ever sincerely loved me and still loves me. But I didn't know that then. I didn't even remember her. And I also understood that she was the only person I could ever love. I met with this girl. Of course, now she's already of an age. But to me, she's the same as she used to be. She loves her garden. She does everything beautifully. And I wanted her to be surrounded by beauty and good neighbors. It would be better if good, happy neighbors, neighbors live nearby. But how could I make that happen? I was a businessman, and I'd accumulated a certain sum of money, so I bought the land and divided it up into plots and thought up these contracts here. And I did this for my beloved, or maybe I did it for myself. John Heisman pronounced his last phrase as if he were asking himself. And as he went on, he spoke as if he didn't even see the people before him as if he was discussing it with himself out loud. We live for some reason, for what reason? We're striving for something, for what? I'll die soon, and what will I leave behind? Nothing but decay. But now I'm determined not to die before I make my project a reality. I will leave behind something eternal. I'll leave behind a garden for my beloved. I'll leave behind gardens at first, I just wanted to hire a lot of workers a contract with a big landscape design company. Contract with them to look after the plantings. But then I realized beauty ends. Sterile somehow, if it isn't somebody's. And so I decided it should be somebody's. So that's why I'm giving you plot of land and houses. And all I'm asking for in return is for beauty all around my beloved. You, did, you didn't believe that the terms were offering you and the contracts were real. You didn't understand what our goal is in offering these contracts. Now you know. John Hitzman fell silent. The people standing in the room were silent too. The first one to break the silence was the woman who'd been most vehement in expressing her distress. First, she quickly walked to the, to the row of tables by the wall where the contracts were laid out, asked one of the secretaries to enter her name and sign the contract without even reading it. 
Then she turned to the people in the room and said, Yes, I signed it. I was the first to sign. I'll go down in history for that because I am the first. Just think about it. No man, no matter how rich he might be, has ever given a greater gift to his beloved than that man standing on stage here. There's no greater gift you could give. No one's ever been able to think of anything greater than that. Not in the entire known history of mankind. Another woman shouted out from the audience. I love you called out a third. I want a plot next to your beloved. What's her name? Asked a fourth. Her name is Heisman, began and then went on. Well, maybe she doesn't need to know about this. Let her think that this is just the way the fates decreed. Moving as one, the people in the room rushed to the tables by the wall. A line formed. People were joking happily and calling each other as nothing less than neighbors. But the great majority of them, especially the women, were directing their gaze, shining with love at the man standing on the stage. For the first time in his life, John Heisman personally experienced the energy of kindness, love, and sincere, sincere delight emanating from a great number of human souls. A healing energy capable of vanquishing everything, any ailments. When he left the stage, he was no longer limp limping. And during the next several months, he personally looked an active part in making sure he personally took an active part in making sure the factories on the land he bought were torn down, personally discussed the details of the plans for the entire settlement around Sally's estate, personally consulted about the landscaping options for each separate plot as well as the entire infrastructure. When after a year, he once again walked up to the gate of Sally's estate, all around, as far as the eye could see, people were already planting large gardens of small saplings. And near Sally Gate, he saw several saplings with carefully wrapped root balls. Sally seemed to have sensed his arrival and ran to meet him. John, it's so good you've come. So good. Hello, John. She ran up to him, fast and ardent as a girl. She sees john's hand and drag him in to have some tea all the while happily talking non-stop you know john what a miraculous thing is going on around here i'm so happy we're usually happy there aren't going to be any smoke sh um, stacks near our house anymore and we have nice neighbors life is so full to bursting all around so full don't you worry if things aren't going well with your with your business john Say the heck with everything and come live here. We're rich now. Our son got a lucrative contract, actually an unusual lucrative contract. Now he's in charge of the landscape design and planning for the whole project here. And we've gotten a little more land too. Our son's going to build himself a new house there. And if you want, you and I will live here. I do want to, John Heisman answered and added, thank you for the invitation, Sally. But why are you going to live in an old house? Rang out a voice behind John Heisman. He turned and saw his son. He knew right away that this was his son. And the young man continued. So I gather that you're my father. When Georgie told me how you thought the photo of mom's childhood friend was a photo of him, then I figured out we'd come to visit. And besides, Mom never been good at hiding her feelings. Of course, I don't feel the same way Mom does about you and I yet, but I'm prepared to finance the construction of a new cottage for my happy parents. Thank you, son, John Heitzman replied, holding back. He wanted to, to go embrace his son, but for some reason he hesitated. The young man took the first step, putting his hand out. He introduced himself, John. This is great. It's wonderful now you've met. When you get to know each other a little better, then you like each other. But for now, let's go have some tea, said Sally. And at the table, Sally once again excitedly talked nonstop about all the unusual goings on in recent months. 
you can't imagine, Chan. Just try to imagine the story they're telling around here. It's like the most beautiful fairy tale in the world. A life fairy tale. Come to life. Just imagine, John. People are saying that one person bought up all this land around here. Then this person invited the best landscape designers, agronomists, and gardeners, and he gave each of them total three several hectares of land that's theirs to use for as long as they live. He told them to make their plots lovely, and he gave them all the saplings and seeds free of charge. And on top of that, he's going to pay for all beautification of those plots of theirs for five years. Just imagine on top of it all, he's going to pay. This person put every last penny he had into this project. Well, maybe not every last penny has been objective, but that's what people say, every last penny. And do you know why he's doing all of this? Why, John Hasman asked calmly. Now, this is the really beautiful part of, what, of what's going on here. He did this so that his beloved would be able to live surrounded by all this beauty. They say she also does landscape design and that she's, she'll also have an estate somewhere around here. But no one knows where she is and who she is. Can you imagine what will happen when people find out who she is? What? What do you mean, what? Everyone will want to get a good look at her right away and even touch her as if she was some kind of goddess. Me personally, I like to touch her. She must be a very unusual person. Maybe she looks unusual on the outside or maybe she's unusual inside. Not a single woman in the world could inspire a man to do such an unusual and lovely thing. That's what everyone around here is saying. So everybody is going to want to see this man and his unusual woman and touch them, see them. I imagine they will, John Heisman agreed. And then he added, so what should we do about that, Sally? Why we, Sally asked in amazement, because that unusual woman, the one for whose sake everything's going on around here is you, Sally. Sally looked at John without blinking, trying to make sense of what she'd heard. Something sank in and the teacup fell from her hand. But no one paid any attention to the sound of the breaking cup. John Heisman turned at the sound of a falling chair and saw that his son had impulsively sprung from his seat. John Jr. went up to his father and speaking on a soft berry tone, said excitedly, Father, father, can I hug you? John Heisman hugged his son first and heard the beating of his heart. John Jr. embraced his father and whispered, elated, I've never heard of anyone declaring his love in such a powerful way. Without any words at all, not anywhere in the world, I'm so proud. I admire you, Father. When Father and Son tur turned toward Sally, she was still taking everything in. Suddenly, her cheeks flushed, and it was if it smoothed out her wrinkles. Teardrop teardrops began flowing from her eyes. Embarrassed at her tears, Sally went right up to John Sr., seized his hand and led him toward the door to the veranda. John Jr. watched as his parents hand in hand set off along the path leading to the Asai, behind which stood their little childhood house. They walked slowly at first, then suddenly set off running toward the Asai, just like teenagers. Ten years later, John Heisman, who'd grown younger now, was sitting in the club cafe along with other men from the community. Laughing, he explained to them, Listen, there's no way I'm going to run for president. Don't even try to convince me, and it has nothing to do with my age. You can run a country without being a president. You can run a country from your own garden. Look. You've shown by your own example how to build a real life. 
and all of America is turning into a blooming garden now. If it keeps on going like this, maybe we'll catch up to Russia. We will catch up. We will. Sally asserted walking in. But right now, Johnny, let's please go home. The little one doesn't want to go to sleep without you. Then she added, whispering in his ear, and neither do I. A pair of young people, John Heisman and Sally, walk hand in hand along the shady, sweetly scented alley toward their house. In the spring, it always seemed to them that their life was only beginning the way real life was beginning all across America.